Mr. Field? Yes, Your Honor. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, Benjamin Field, for plaintiff appellant Waylon Bailey, who's with us today in the gallery. Waylon was arrested for making a zombie joke to a small group of friends on Facebook. The Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office responded by deploying a SWAT team to arrest him without a warrant and without any further investigation beyond reading the post. The district court below held that Bailey had no constitutional protection for his speech based on long discredited World War I era cases that allowed jailing war protesters. That was wrong and this court should reverse for it boils down to two fundamentally independent reasons. The first, which would allow this court to reverse on all claims, is that Bailey's speech was protected by the First Amendment. Decades of Supreme Court case law made it clear that speech like Bailey's is protected and that it wasn't incitement. Arresting Bailey for that speech therefore violated clearly established First Amendment law and also the Fourth Amendment because protected speech cannot alone provide probable cause for a warrantless arrest. And there's a second and independent basis to reverse too, which is that Louisiana terrorism law under which Mr. Bailey was arrested just doesn't apply to a zombie joke. The statute is targeted at true threats like bomb threats or hijacking hoaxes and its text and its interpreting case law should have made that clear to defendants. So there was no probable cause to arrest Bailey even setting aside the constitutional speech issues. That means that the Fourth Amendment and the false arrest claim should have succeeded for that independent reason. So now to take these two in turn, first starting with the speech issues. Multiple lines of cases established that it was clear that Bailey's speech was constitutionally protected. Whether that's the decades of cases saying that content-based enforcement is presumptively unconstitutional, the cases like Hustler establishing that jokes are satire protected, or the cases like City of Houston versus Hill, which make clear that criticizing the government and police are protected. So all of these should have made it abundantly clear to Detective Isles that arresting Bailey was presumptively unconstitutional. The only question is whether one of the narrow First Amendment exceptions would have applied to Bailey's speech. The only exception invoked by the district court was the incitement exception. Defendants aren't even really defending that anymore, which I think is telling. And Mr. Bailey's speech clearly wasn't incitement. We know from Brandenburg that incitement requires three things. It requires that the speech is one, advocacy. Two, that it's directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action. And three, that it's actually likely to incite that lawless action. Mr. Bailey's speech fails on all three of those counts. It wasn't advocating anything. It wasn't directing anybody to do anything. And it wasn't likely to actually cause lawlessness, as indeed it didn't cause lawlessness. And all of the people in the comments were just joking because this was banter among friends. And the case is- Could it only be viewed by his Facebook friends or could it be viewed by anybody who went on to Facebook? Uh, so how public it was isn't in the record, Your Honor, but we do know is who actually did see it. And it was only Mr. Bailey's friends. In the record, we know that you know, Mr. Bailey was responding to a joke by a friend of his. That friend in the comments says, uh, LOL, and he talking about my post gonna get me flagged. You know, smiley laughing face, he wins. Uh, and then the post that Detective Isles focused on, two of those were by Mr. Bailey himself responding to this friend saying, this is your fault and you made me do this. Clearly banter, Mr. Bailey clearly wasn't trying to terrorize himself. And then the final one that Detective Isles focused on, the I'm reporting you, was by Mr. Bailey's wife. Clearly this was just banter among friends in the Facebook comments. There wasn't any intent to terrorize. And I think that the incitement cases, the modern incitement cases, not these World War I era cases, make it abundantly clear that this wasn't incitement. So in Brandenburg itself, you have Klansmen in arm, uh, who are armed in front of a burning cross with hoods, saying that 400,000 Klansmen are gonna march on Congress, threatening revengeance. And that's broadcast on national TV and local TV. Supreme Court says that's not incitement. In Hess, you've got protesters who've actually taken over the street in a Vietnam War protest. And one of them says that the protesters, when the police are dispersing them, says the protesters are going to take the street using more colorful language than that. Supreme Court says clearly not incitement in light of Brandenburg. 
In an NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware, you've got the NAACP organizing a boycott of racist white businesses in Claiborne County, Mississippi, and one of the leaders says things like, boycott violators are going to be disciplined. If we catch any of you going in any of them racist stores, we're going to break your damn neck. The Supreme Court said under Brandenburg, that is clearly protected speech. If all of those things are protected, it is obvious that Mr. Bailey's zombie joke is not incitement. And I think it's telling that not even the defendants are really arguing that it's incitement anymore. And it, so it's not incitement, which means it's protected, and arresting Mr. Bailey for that speech violated clearly established First Amendment law. But it also resolved the Fourth Amendment inquiry, because clearly protected speech cannot provide probable cause for an arrest. And we know that from cases like this court's decision in Davidson, where you had somebody arrested for protesting outside of an abortion clinic. And the court there took exactly the route that we're asking it to take here. It said, first, you know, the Texas statute that the officers were stretching didn't apply in the first instance, so no probable cause. But separately, additionally, the plaintiff's right to protest prohibited the officer's application of the statute in the manner employed there. And so for those two independent reasons, Davidson defeated qualified immunity because there was both a clear First Amendment right and that First Amendment right eviscerated any probable cause for Fourth Amendment purposes. As we also establish in pages 23 to 25 of our reply brief, there's just a host of cases from across the circuits showing that when you've got clearly protected speech, it's pretty easy to overcome qualified immunity because the First Amendment. Did you brief the First Amendment uh, issues for the trial court? Uh, so, Your Honor, they were raised in the complaint. I think that the key issue is that the standard for preservation is that it has to be raised. Yes, predicted to that. Uh, the district judge was talking about clear and present danger. And, you know, it's pretty basic that Brandenburg redefined the world uh, in, in, in terms of that. I just got the sense that, that um, you didn't give the district court uh, much help but, uh, and, uh, with regard to the First Amendment issues. I think that's right, Your Honor, that it was, he was breaking from the law of Brandenburg. Well, uh, it's, in fairness to the district court, I mean, you, don't, you weren't pointing that out, you weren't arguing that to him. Uh, apparently, no one was. The parties were arguing the Louisiana law, but the standard is something is before this court on review if it's raised or decided below. That's the standard in Lampton. It could have been sua sponte. Even. I'm just chatting you a little bit, but I'm waiting to get to New Orleans to make your argument. Well, Your Honor, that is the basis on which the district court decided the First Amendment argument. And, I'm ha I, and I think that maybe the way I can more directly address it is I think that it's also, it should have been clear to the district court that the Louisiana statute didn't apply, and so they, he wouldn't have needed to have reached this uh, thorny, potentially thornier issue. And so let me just turn to that now, um, which is that, you know, if you look at this actual statute and the case law interpreting it, it should have been obvious to Detective Isles that it didn't apply to Mr. Bailey's zombie joke. It requires intentional communication with the intent of causing members of the general public to be in sustained fear or causing evacuation of a building or other serious disruption. If you just look at the face of the statute, it's clearly targeted at things like bomb threats or hijacking hoaxes, not zombie jokes. And the cases applying it make it abundantly clear that that's so. So there are cases like Lewis saying that specific intent is required. You have cases in the immediate aftermath of Columbine. So, you know, all of the, everything that the district court was talking about, about how it was a stressful time, exact same situation in the immediate aftermath of Columbine. But in state XREL RT, you've got the Louisiana Supreme Court saying that a student talking to other students in the immediate aftermath of Columbine, hypothesizing shooting up a school or bombing the school, that isn't sufficiently imminent to violate the statute. You've got state XREL JS saying that someone, again, in the immediate aftermath of Columbine, writing on a school bathroom, everyone will die May 28, 1999, be ready. That didn't violate the statute. And so I think the case law is just abundantly clear that speech far more egregious than Mr. Bailey's joke didn't violate the statute. Isles should have known that his didn't either. And as to Isles' point that he thought that law enforcement 
was being threatened by the speech. First, he's got a timing problem because he's focused, the way he describes it, he's clearly thinking about later in the summer after the George Floyd protest, not March 2020. So, you know, these law enforcement protests weren't even going on in March 2020. But also, we have the case of State versus Brown, where you've got somebody calling into the police department saying he's going to shoot police who come to his neighborhood, even threatening some officers by name. And the Louisiana appellate court said that doesn't violate the statute because police officers are not members of the general public for purpose of this statute. And so in so many ways, Detective Isles was on very, very clear notice that the statute didn't apply to Mr. Bailey's speech. And as this court said in Alexander, you know, it is the officers in the clearly established law context of evaluating qualified immunity is an objective standard, and so officers are held to know what the law is. And as the court said in Alexander, page 307, it's telling that in their brief, the defendants point to no Texas case interpreting the statute otherwise. We're in the exact same situation, just substitute Louisiana for Texas. They have no case law whatsoever suggesting that this Louisiana terrorism statute could ever reasonably be applied to speech like Mr. Bailey's. So I think that the, the final red herring that they've thrown out is this Nevis exception, which is a principle in First Amendment retaliation law that if there's a retaliatory arrest, that you need probable cause to, you need a lack of probable cause in order to make a claim. But this is a red herring for two independent reasons. First, for the two reasons I've been discussing, there is no probable cause here, so it wouldn't apply even if we were in a classic retaliation context. But second, those kinds of retaliation cases have to do where police are arresting somebody for conduct and then the claim from the plaintiff is that actually speech was, that was all pretext and that speech was the actual reason for the arrest. In this case, there's no dispute that Detective Isles was arresting Bailey solely based on the content of his speech, and so that line of cases just isn't relevant here in any event. I'd like to conclude simply by framing exactly what the facts are and how obvious it should have been to Detective Isles that this speech wasn't incitement and that it was protected. We have a, a, a post which is self-evidently farcical that ends with hashtag we need you Brad Pitt in reference to a Brad Pitt zombie movie, and then a frowny face emoji and a bright X emoji. We have a fact that nobody was actually concerned. Uh, Detective Lyle testified that nobody called the police department concerned, nobody evacuated any buildings, nothing like that happened. There was just banter in the comments among friends indicating that this was a joke and it was taken as a joke. And indeed, the sheriff's office itself acted as if it took it as a joke. So you have the officers arriving in a SWAT team formation with their guns pointed at Bailey. They laugh at him. They say the next thing you write on Facebook should be not to fuck with the police. And I apologize for the language, but I think it's critical to understanding that the officers were treating this as they just didn't like being the butt of a joke, not that they saw it as a serious threat or incitement. And indeed, Isles' report after the fact indicates that he believed Bailey uh, when he told him that it was a joke. In the report, this is at page 130 of the record, he said there was no ill will towards the sheriff's office. He only meant it as a joke, referring to Mr. Bailey. And so I think that the evidence is just absolutely overwhelming that nobody took this speech to be incitement, certainly not incitement that arises to the Brandenburg standard. So it was protected by the First Amendment. And there's no, I think, argument on the other side that any reasonable officer in light of clearly established Louisiana law could have thought that the Louisiana terrorism statute applied to the law. For those two independent reasons, Bailey's constitutional rights were violated, there was no probable cause, and so the court should reverse on all claims. If there are no further questions, I'll reserve the balance of my time for rebuttal. Thank you, counsel. Good afternoon. I'm Brad Calvert. I'm here on behalf of Sheriff Wood and Detective Isles. I'd like to first begin the discussion about what claims are actually before the court. Uh, the plaintiff's attorney just explained that implicit in his complaint was a First Amendment on the merits claim as well as a First Amendment retaliation claim. Here, at least at the court of appeal level, he's trying to establish two separate claims. However, when you look at the complaint 
and look at the briefing that led to the judgment from the, the trial court, that's not so. In fact, when the plaintiff's attorney's brief hit, that's the first mention at all of Brandenburg and all those other cases that he just spent 10 minutes describing. For example, in the complaint at page 9, paragraph 6, the plaintiff, alleged, the plaintiff alleged when an arrestee, when arrest is made in response to speech, and when there is no probable cause for the arrest, the arrestee, excuse me, the arrestor violates the First Amendment. Clearly, that's contemplating the retaliation cases, including uh, Nevis, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Nevis. Uh, the, the next paragraph, paragraph 86, says Isles was arrested, Defendant Isles arrested Mr. Bailey and instituted criminal charges without probable cause and in violation of the First Amendment. And critically, uh, page 20, paragraph 87, by and through the conduct outlined above, Defendant Isles retaliated against Mr. Bailey because he posted a joke that was at the expense of the RPSO. Not only that, if you look at the, their brief, excuse me, their memo in support of their MSJ, they say, excuse me, they filed an uh, MSJ, they filed a response to our MSJ. In the response to our MSJ, they said, Mr. Bailey's First Amendment claim rises or falls with his Fourth Amendment claim. Defendants argue if they had probable cause to arrest Bailey, then his First Amendment claim fails as well. Defendants are correct. To, and then it goes on to say, to prevail on First Amendment retaliation claim, a plaintiff must plead and prove the absence of probable cause. And they cite Nevis in that case. Now on appeal, they come up and say, well, Nevis is wrong. Nevis doesn't apply. Similarly, in a case that they also didn't speak about, the only civil rights case uh, decided in Louisiana or under Louisiana law on this exact issue uh, was the Stokes versus Faber case, which we briefed extensively, uh, 522 F sub 3rd 226. Uh, again, in that case, a variety of claims with squishy terms in it was filed. In the briefing on the MSJ in footnote 9, the district court in favor said, the, the court adds that defendant's motion for summary judgment is intended to challenge all remaining federal and state law claims in this case, which is what we did. One of the difficulties that all the defendants in this case had at its inception was discerning from the pleadings which claims were brought against which defendants. The court identified this problem when it ruled on Farber's motion to dismiss because the pleadings invoked a litany of constitutional rights, many of which seemed in, in, inapplicable to the case in, under plaintiff's own version of the facts. Given that plaintiff's opposition does not allude to any claims other than the ones specifically addressed in the defendant's motion for summary judgment, it is only fair to assume that the moving defendants have correctly identified all remaining claims against them and properly challenged them all on summary judgment. Similar issue that we have here. So we have an argument and a field that was set by the plaintiffs and they lose it at the trial court. Then they come on to, a pay, to appeal and they try to construct another argument from the bones of the case that they lost. And I've briefed extensively in, in, the, in, in my arguments in, in, the, in, the, in writing about waiver and forfeiture, which I believe y'all are familiar with. The next thing that I'd like to address is, uh, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but uh, in Nevis, or Nevis, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, the plaintiff's attorney just sat up here and said that Nevis and the cases that cite Nevis and follow it in the Fifth Circuit are about criminal acts, not speech. If you look at the Seventh, excuse me, the Ninth Circuit case that was reversed by Nevis, probable cause was found for the arrest based upon an Alaskan statute. The Alaskan statute says a person commits the crime of harassment in the second degree if, with the intent to harass or annoy another person, that person insults, taunts, or challenges another person in a manner likely to provoke an immediate violent response. If you go look at the lower court cases in Nevis, 
there was a dispute between a police officer and some citizens at some kind of wild winter festival in some small town in Alaska. And there was a verbal dispute between the officers and the ultimate arrestee. And that was the probable cause that was found by the district court in the Ninth Circuit. And so that was the factual underpinnings of Nevis. When the Supreme Court wrote Nevis, they discussed uh, disorderly conduct, but the actual probable cause found, finding made by the district court and the Ninth Circuit was a violation of this harassment statute. So clearly, Nevis does contemplate not just actions, not just cr other crimes, it also contemplates an arrest based on speech. The Alaskan statute that's found in the Nevis uh, Bartlett case that was on, uh, the, the Seventh Circuit, Ninth Circuit case is 11.61.120, sections A and 1. And that's at the, at the appellate level uh, in, in the, the Bartlett, Bartlett Nevis cases. <clears throat> All right, so now I'll try to get back on track. Uh, in the Stokes case, which I mentioned just briefly before, that is the only civil rights case that deals with internet postings and terrorism. That case was reported, uh, initially was unreported, then it was turned to an F sub third while the Fifth Circuit side of Stokes was pending. These are all cited in my brief. But in Stokes, again, a terrorizing statute, uh, students were acting up in a classroom. A student and the teacher were talking about uh, classroom school shooters. And they gave the generic uh, description of a classroom, typical classroom school shooter. It was one person in the classroom that matched that generic description. They perhaps embarrassed him, perhaps cajoled him to go down and they wrote on the chalkboard, next school shooter, and had the, 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 the prototype of a school shooter right there. Someone took the photo, someone else posted the photo, and the person that was taken in the photo was the one that was arrested under the terrorism statutes. The trial court found both probable cause and qualified immunity, arguable probable cause. It went to the Fifth Circuit, which is unreported, but it goes off on the same analysis that we've talked about in the what is probable cause for terrorizing. Now, in that case, the person that was arrested didn't do anything. The investigation by the detectives in that case revealed the teacher said it was a joke, the other student said it was a joke, and they still found two arrests for that uh, incident to be qualified. Quali that's qualified. nothing akin to what we have here. That, the, the fact scenario that you're describing to I'm us, sorry? the fact scenario that you're describing to us in detail right now has, is, is, is that analogous to the facts yes, that we is. have here? Because, How so? Because it got posted on the internet. And so the photo that was not taken by the guy that was arrested, taken by other people, got posted on the internet. People saw it and reported a post on an internet. That's how the investigation developed. Same as the one here. This statement was posted on the internet. It was brought to the attention of the, the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Detectives Division. The commander of the Texas division called in Mr. Isles, Detective Isles, and said, here, we have this complaint. Go take a look into it. And that's what Isles did. So it's the same concept in that uh, of posting on the Internet. So there was a citizen's complaint? On the one, which one? I'm sorry. This case. The, 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 the detective was called into his boss's office, and the boss gave him the, the, the uh, the printout of the uh, post, and so there's a complaint on this, go take a look at it. So there was a citizen's complaint. That's what the detective understood from what the boss said. He didn't- So you don't know the answer to my question. Well, but it's part of what the, all I know is what the detective knew, which is boss well, gives you know it to what him. the detective said. There's no dispute about that. So that's- All right, my only right. question was, was there a citizen's complaint? And, and that's the what answer, was reported. The answer is you, you don't know. Sure. You know that the detective said, we got a complaint right. on this. All right. That's the captain said. And so that was the instructions carried out by the detective. 
So getting back to Stokes, that's the only case out there on this exact issue. Now certainly it's a district court case that ended up being reported later and then a, a per curiam unpublished opinion later. But that's the only guidance there was or is on this at, other than Bailey. Now if you go look at the decision by the trial court in this matter, he did the, the decision in a disjunctive alternative basis. He did a factual analysis, found probable cause. Then he went on and talked about the First Amendment claim in a brief fashion. Then he went back and said, even assuming that the First Amendment, Amendment issues are here, there's still no claim because there was probable cause. So the entirety of the discussion, I'm sorry, you have a question? I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. So the entirety of the discussion about the, the other cases uh, out uh, concerning, and I'll call it a merits First Amendment versus a retaliatory First Amendment. The merits First Amendment were never presented in the pleadings, never presented in the arguments. It was a surprise when it surfaced over two paragraphs in the decision, and it was a huge surprise when it was expounded upon in the briefs. So my position is that all of that discussion has no bearing on where this case truly is. If there's probable cause under Nevis and the cases in the Fifth Circuit that cite Nevis, that's the end of it. Now there is an exception in Nevis that there were, for example, other arrests that were not made. In other was it I also determined that, that it was a violation of a Louisiana statute to, I'm sorry? to make this post? Was it Detective Isles who made that, I'm saying Well, sure, yeah. He, was he a, made that determination yeah. that it was a violation of the statute. Yes, yeah. And, it, and it's detailed in the brief what, what led to that and the elements of the brief, I mean, the elements of the crime that he felt. And again, his decisions or his feelings isn't determinative of whether there's probable cause. That's certainly an objective, objective standard. But in order to prevail in this case, the plaintiffs have to show no probable cause or no arguable probable cause. And another way to phrase that is, no reasonable officer under the similar circumstances would have believed that his actions were unconstitutional. And with the guidance in Stokes, albeit not you know, determinative, that shows that federal judges in a very similar fact pattern went through the same analysis that the district court did in this case without relying on Stokes and found qualified immunity was applicable, both because there was probable cause and because uh, the, the, other, the other prong of, of qualified immunity. One of the difficulties I have with your, the district court's analysis of the First Amendment is that he got the law wrong. Uh, he, he applied the law for the, most of our First Amendment jurisprudence comes from, from the 1916-1917 today. That's the real, real world, out of World War I coming forward. Uh, Clear and present danger and those standards, he stopped there. That's why I asked why he was given more help, uh, because the law is quite different, and you can go, pa go past that to Brandenburg. Brandenburg redefined the terrain. And that's, so I, what we've got to do is apply the law as it is, uh, not someone's misapprehension of it. Now, the question is so, <clears throat> what we have before us is, is, what, is this particular. Uh, the basic fact pattern here of what we know, know exactly what was posted, we've got a picture of it, and we know exactly what happened. Yes, sir. And so our question is, is, is that, <clears throat> what do you do with that uh, and the remedies for it? And so I, 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 it helps me if you zero in on and tell me uh, something as to whether or not the, it, anyone could look at that uh, objectively and take that to be a serious threat under, under current law. Uh, well, as far as the judge making an error or whatever, uh, no, no real comment on that, but that, that does, that's not germane to whether we win or lose. No, that, that's not going to help us here. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but the question, there is a very, there is a, to me, that it is not obvious at all that this is anything other than a joke, frankly, as I look at it. Now, somebody, the question is whether that's a reasonable judgment for, for the officer to make, not, not, for, not for a judge. Well, the joke is added to it later. 
all these supposed facts about his friends weighing in and his wife weighing in, none of that was, Mr. Isles didn't tell the, the deputy any of that. Uh, the deputy's looking at the pages printed out from the internet, and he looks and sees the comment and several following comments. If Mr. Isles knew who all those folks were, then the deputy Isles needed to have been told that. That would have negated potentially, uh, but that's not what was there. Isles has the comment. He's got these three or four incendiary, from his perspective, comments showing that some people are lending some kind of authority to that comment. And so based on that, he affects an arrest. Under Stokes versus Faber, that was, fact was the hashtag Brad Pitt included in what he was looking. If at? you read his deposition, well, I've read his deposition. He didn't know who that was. He's a country boy. He's a sheriff deputy. So, uh, uh, right. uh, okay. he, he didn't know who Brad Pitt was. Not in relation to what he didn't know Brad Pitt in relation to the zombie movie in relation to that comment. He knew Brad Pitt in a general sense, right. but. Yeah, I'm sorry if I, if I miss. I mean, yeah, he knew Brad Pitt, sure. But as far as the leaps between the, that and whatever else, he didn't make any connection. So, getting back, uh, we have Stokes one and two, which lend credence, lend support that there was qualified immunity. Nevis is not a case that can be distinguished. Nevis says that a First Amendment retaliation claim can apply to an arrest for speech. As far as the criminal cases, if you look at the Brown case, for example, Captain Jimmy Hay was the investigating officer on that, and the threats were made to and from police officers, and the court found that police officers weren't part of the general public. That's not an issue here. It's, it's a, all these criminal matters are different elements of the, the, the terrorism statute. I think that's all the comments I have. If you have other questions, be more than happy. All right. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Rebuttal. few quick points, Your Honor. First, to Judge Graves, your question. The answer is that no, there were no citizen complaints. Detective Isles testifies his deposition, this is at pages 195 to 197 of the record, uh, that no members of the public were concerned, his supervisors never said anybody was concerned, nobody was injured, there were no disruption, riots, or protests. You know, we went through all of the questions that would have been relevant for the statute. He said no to all of them. Second, in terms of preservation uh, and the First Amendment. So this, this the First Amendment claim was plainly made in the complaint. If you look at pages 19 to 20 of the record, we've got. Me keep your voice up and slow down just a bit. I'm listening with the sub yes, here. I apologize, Your Honor. I can get a little overexcited. He's got better hearing than I have. <laughs> so, you know, paragraph 79 says, Mr. Bailey posted a joke satire at the expense of the, para of the sheriff's office. 84 says, he was arrested for engaging in political speech. 85 said there was no probable cause for the arrest. 87, he retaliated against Mr. Bailey's speech. So there was plainly a First Amendment claim here. And the district court actually decided the First Amendment issue based on, as Judge Higginbotham pointed out, erroneous law. That means under Lampton and all of this cases, all of this court's preservation decisions, that the issue is before this court. It has to be that way. Otherwise, there'd be no way to challenge a district court opinion that was made on some sua sponte ground. Independently, as uh, Professor Volokh's brief for the three professors points out, appellate courts have an independent obligation to ensure that First Amendment rights aren't being violated below. That's pages 11 and 13 to his brief. And we can just set the Nevis thing aside altogether. So should we send it back to give the district court an opportunity to apply what, what you believe to be the correct law? 
I think that is one option, but I think the court should give direction on what the correct law is and how demanding the Brandenburg standard is. But even now, I didn't hear my friend to say anything suggesting that this speech wasn't protected or to say that it was incitement. And so I think that in reality, on this record, there just can be no question that the speech is protected and that it didn't violate the Louisiana statute. The Stokes case on which my friend relied entirely, as Judge Douglas pointed out, is entirely distinct. The parties there didn't bring up any of these First Amendment issues or Louisi any of the Louisiana cases that would have made it clear to Detective Isles that he didn't have probable cause to arrest. And it was factually distinct for the reason that there actually was public concern in the Stokes case. I'd also ask the court to read uh, Judge Duncan's dissent, which I think quite clearly shows why, you know, I, I have questioned the result in that case anyway. I'm Ross. Say that again, a little slower and a little louder. I, I just, I think Judge Duncan's dissent is very persuasive on why the majority in that unpublished opinion is not persuasive. The Ross case from the Eighth Circuit is better. It's the case that actually is exactly like this. And finally, I just take my friend to be arguing that if you post something on the internet, or if an officer doesn't bother to actually look into the context, that he can run roughshod over the First Amendment. That's not the law, and this court should reverse. Thank you, counsel.